This panel is on owning AI and protecting AI output. It asks the question, what happens when you have artificial intelligence output without a human, a traditional human author or inventor and recent legal developments on point? Uh, we are going to go in the following order by previous consensus, uh, Professor Artie Rye, then Professor Danny Gervais, then uh, Laura Sheridan, then uh, Professor Dennis Crouch, and then Professor Sangjo Jong. I'll introduce, uh, give a fuller bio for each as I introduce each of them individually. Uh, and I will start with Professor Rye. Professor Rye is the Elvin Laddie Professor of Law and Faculty Director and the, uh, for the Center for Innovation Policy at Duke's Law School. Uh, she's an internationally recognized expert in intellectual property uh, law and innovation policy, administrative law, and health law. She serves as senior advisor on innovation-related law and policy issues to the Department of Commerce's Office of General Counsel. She also regularly advises other federal and state agencies as well as Congress on these issues. She's a member of multiple distinguished councils, including the National Academies Forum on Drug Discovery, Development, and Translation, the Polaris Advisory Council to the Government Accountability Office, and the American Law Institute. Uh, Professor Rye will speak for seven minutes, as will everybody else, and we'll go to questions and answer, uh, answer after that. Professor Rye, the floor is yours. Oh, I just, oh, by the way, I just saw a, um, uh, a question of the CLE code. I'll discuss that after all those panelists have spoken. Professor Rye. Thanks so much, Professor Quays. Can everyone hear me all right? Perfect. So I'm really delighted to be here around this very distinguished panel. I'm a big fan of Ryan Abbott's work, and so I'm delighted that the Center for Intellectual Property has decided to showcase it. This panel, I think, addresses some really important and vexing questions about which I've written, and I'll follow up with a slide at the end with references, just a quick slide. So the, the question of quote, owning AI and protecting AI output, unquote, is important to break down a little. So the concept of owning AI output is probably more understandable. Of course, owning output does raise issues of whether AI can be an inventor. It also highlights the issue of whether the pervasive use of AI raises the obviousness standard by which inventions are judged. And I'm happy to talk about that in the general discussion. But for my brief opening remarks, I just wanna focus on the owning AI aspect that has been the subject of my writing, not AI output, but the AI itself. So what does that mean exactly? That's an important threshold question one has to consider. Are we talking about owning the structure of the training data, owning the learning algorithm, owning the process of training the learning al algorithm, or last but certainly not least, the algorithmic model that emerges after the learning algorithm has been trained on the data. Well, it seems to me it can be all of the above. What does that mean for patenting? Well, of course, algorithms raise all sorts of patent eligibility questions that we all know about. I'm not sure they're necessarily unique to machine learning algorithms but we can talk about that. With respect to data structures, those also raise some really interesting patent eligibility questions. And I know from work that I've done, empirical work I've done interviewing VCs on machine learning models, they're quite concerned about the patent eligibility issue. And I, I agree that that's something that's really important. But what I will talk about right now is the issue of disclosure, because I think it's important not just for the innovation aspect, for cumulative innovation that patents attempt to promote, but also from a larger social perspective, because folks are concerned about black box models. Um, so disclosure, of course, promotes not just cumulative innovation, but also accountability. So in my view, the disclosure question is particularly hard when it comes to claims drawn to the ultimate algorithmic model that emerges based on the training. So the other actual black box. In that case, maybe the patent owner should only be able to get a product by process claim because we don't actually know what the black box is completely. In the context of complex biological mo molecules that are hard to describe, as I've written, product by process claims are sometimes used. So this is not completely 
terra incognita in terms of material we've never thought about before. Um, and in that area, in the context of complex biological molecules, we also have procedures that allow deposits of materials that are hard to reproduce. So could we, for example, in the context of really complicated machine learning models, require patent um, owners to, or patent applicants to, to do product by process disclosure and maybe even be limited to product by process claims, they might also in certain scenarios be required to give training data and even perhaps the ultimate trained machine learning model, which admittedly those latter options seem a little bit extreme, but there we are. And um, we could go to that extreme if we wanted to think about it, at least conceptually. Now, it's interesting to think about whether these sorts of heightened disclosure requirements was something the patent community could live with. The USPTO, as many of you probably know, recently asked about whether there were disclosure-related considerations unique to AI inventions. It even went so far as to say, or use the example of, quote, deep learning systems that may have a large number of hidden layers with weights that evolve during the learning slash training process without human intervention or knowledge, unquote. So the PTO is up on this. Um, it also asked more generally about unpredictability of AI inventions relative to traditional algorithms. Now, according to the PTO's summary responses, the commenters were mixed, but interestingly, some commenters did explicitly note the analogy to life sciences technology. So it's something to think about um, as we go forward. Finally, just one last note, these models that emerge, of course, are not static. They are supposed to continuously learn. And so there's the issue of whether dynamic disclosure is something that we should think about. Scholars, including myself, but not certainly not limited to myself, professors Fromer and Shirko and many others have talked about possibilities of dynamic disclosure in other contexts. In other words, the patent um, EU patentee would update their disclosure as their models um, grew, if you will. Um, that also, also is perhaps aspirational, but uh, I do want to throw all those ideas out there so as to create fodder for discussion. And of course, in all of those contexts, we have to think about the proper balance of patents and trade secrecy for purposes of incentivizing innovation. Um, so that's a big issue from my standpoint, at least. Um, and I really look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rai. And our uh, next speaker will be Professor Daniel Gervais. Uh, Professor Gervais is the Milton Underwood Chair in, uh, in, uh, in Law and the Professor of French, at, uh, the Director of the Vanderbilt Intellectual Property Program at Vanderbilt Law School. He focuses on international intellectual property law and the law of artificial intelligence. He spent 10 years researching and addressing policy issues as a legal officer of the World Trade Organization as head of the WTO, uh, sec uh, the section of the World Intellectual Property or Organization Copyright Project, and as Deputy General, uh, Deputy Secretary General of the International Confederation of Societies of Authors and Composers, and as Vice Chair of the International Federation of Reproductive Rights Organizations. He's the author of the TRIPS Agreement, Drafting History and Analysis, a Leading Guide to the Text that Governs International Intellectual Property Rights. Professor Gervais, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, <clears throat> Eric, can you hear me? Yes. Very good, can you see my slides? Yes. Even better, okay. So I have a long title on this slide. I will try to uh, run through um, my points, which will be a little different. Uh, and I missed some of the presentation, especially yesterday. So uh, I don't know if those points were made, but uh, I'm gonna ask some slightly different questions uh, perhaps uh, today. Um, and my questions are really, uh, should we protect uh, AI outputs by IP? And uh, I ask these questions, I don't think uh, of myself as a Luddite, but I'm definitely a skeptic uh, when it comes to giving AI outputs IP protection. Um, and the reason for my skepticism is uh, basically that the reason I went into IP, and I think that's probably true of many people on this uh, call is that uh, I think we're we're attracted to what humans do best, uh, which is to use our higher mental faculties to invent and create. Uh, I actually wrote a little book about that uh, if you're interested. But uh, 
what I heard a lot of, and it's true, of course, on, on the previous panel and other uh, speakers were uh, explanations of how better and cheaper everything will be with AI. Uh, my point is a little different. I don't disagree with any of that, but I do uh, want to uh, ask, that means without humans, right? Or at least with fewer uh, humans doing the uh, authoring and inventing. Uh, yes, we'll have more new things. There's no question. Uh, more of, you know, fill in the blank. Um, and so the, the, mo mo much of the discussion about AI and IP basically says, well, uh, more AI is good. Um, and let's use IP to have as much as possible end of discussion. And I could end here and say, OK, let's let's turn to the next speaker. But I'm not quite there. Um, so you may have uh, 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 seen one of uh, my papers on copyright, where I, I, I was uh, highly skeptical of the uh, need to protect AI outputs by, by copyright. Uh, Ryan, uh, to his credit, has agreed to publish this chapter in his book on AI and IP, and I'm very grateful that that he's agreed to to let a skeptic uh, uh, speak uh, in, in in that book, uh, which is on SSRN. But um, here's my um, where I think I'm going against the grain in ways that this view that technological progress in any field, in any way, in any direction, is necessarily a good thing. That's very ingrained, and we have to let it happen. Uh, admittedly, some things that come out are not necessarily good, but but we really let the, need to let progress happen, uh, which leads to belief, which I heard on uh, our, our previous panels, that if AI creates something of value, then surely the law must find a way to protect it. There's this idea that something new of value would not be protected by IP or something else seems uh, uh, itself uh, uh, a question um, not worth asking. Um, could this end badly? Well. My suggestion is very uh, simple this morning, and I'm here because I have seven minutes to ask questions. I won't provide the answers. Maybe in the Q&A, we can get to some of them. Uh, but I do worry when machines are getting uh, really good at writing books and music, uh, and they are better than human researchers in labs in many ways. We heard that from uh, previous speakers. And I add to this the fact that AI machines are being taught uh, to be very good, and they are very good at manipulating our cognitive biases. Um, so you put all that, and I ask, could this end maybe badly? Um, so my point in summary is very, uh, it, it are on this slide. Um, AI is clearly adding to what humans can do, but it is also replacing humans. And some of this replacement is unquestionably good. When you see these robots in the Amazon warehouse, you say, yeah, I'm sure no one really wanted this mind-numbing job to begin with. And we heard a lot about new pharmaceutical treatments. And of course, you know, who could be against that? But if you replace humans who are doing or using their higher mental faculties to, to as, their, as their, not their, their, just their job, but their way of uh, uh, you know, uh, becoming a growing and, and, and uh, self-actualizing, I think it's qualitatively different. All that being said, however, even if you agree, even in part with what I said, we have a regulatory conundrum, which is um, uh, uh, that even if you agree that pushing AI to replace human authors and inventors as much as possible, you know, may, may not be a good thing. And I'm not alone in, in thinking that. Uh, some people say, well, you know, we need empirical data to, you know, make, make policy and it will probably be too late by the time we get this empirical data. And then more importantly, whenever we try to regulate progress, um, we um, often uh, make mistakes. It's a very risky proposition. It gets in the way, of, of course, of free enterprise. And policymaking is always educated guessing at best because regulation is necessarily about the future, not the past. Uh, one example of this is the debate about, say, the precautionary principle, which I uh, can go into more detail. But from this, I will draw very quickly three conclusions. Uh, the first is this, that um, adding to what uh, humans can do uh, with AI uh, may have a positive valence, uh, but when AI replaces uh, authors and inventors, I think it's fair to ask in aggregate if this is uh, a positive development. That's because, and, and why do we have IP again, is to, to promote progress. And the point can be summarized again with the time I have in this way. Change happens. 
there's nothing we can do about that. Change happens, but progress, not necessarily. That's the whole idea behind IP is to incentivize change that is in fact progress. So that leads, and this is my last slide, to two policy cho choices. Um, the question is, should we accept as a matter of policy, authors and inventors that are not human? Uh, I believe there are actually other ways to provide incentives for some of the AI outputs where they are needed. Um, and other speakers, uh, particularly on the previous panel, were discussing patentability and copyrightability, copyrightability sorry, tests. Uh, those are meant to reflect human cognitive biases, notions like obviousness and so on developed as human notions. Now we're trying to apply them to how machines function, which is radically different of how humans think. Obviously, it's going to be complicated. Maybe our IP toolbox needs new tool. And then here goes the eye rolls. Uh, if we recognize machines as authors and inventors, why not as people? Um, and this may sound like a crazy proposition, but I'm actually writing about this and I, I, uh, it's not as simple as it sounds. So basically it comes down to this, should we use IP law to accelerate the replacement of humans performing what has defined us as a species, which is our ability to use our higher mental faculties. And I will leave it at that and I'm, uh, I'd be happy to discuss in the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Gervais. Next is Laura Sheridan. Laura uh, Sheridan is Senior Patent Counsel at Google. She leads a team focused on defining Google's global patent portfolio strategy. She also works in patent policy issues and speaks on a range of topics. Uh, prior to joining Google, she was in private practice in New York, which is specialized in patent prosecution, litigation, IP, due diligence, and post-grant practice. She's active in the IP community. She serves as a co-chair for the Intellectual Property Owners Association Women in IP Committee and the New York Intellectual Property Law Association Corporate Council Committee. I'll, uh, Ms. Sheridan, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. How's my sound? Is it okay? A little quiet, but good if we can work with it if that's all you got. I, how's this? Any Actually, better? No, this is great. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you. Um, and first, I'm really glad to be here to be part of this event um, and this distinguished panel. Um, for my portion, I wanted to talk a little bit about some comments that Google is going to be uh, submitting to the PTO today on AI and patenting, uh, along with some other feedback on how I think the patent system is working in the context of these issues. Um, and I'm coming to this from a different perspective than the other panelists, obviously. I am I'm bringing an industry view um, and as someone who works at a company um, that's deeply involved in this area. And so I have three main takeaways and I'll just give a little bit of detail on each in my brief remarks. Um, the first is that AI innovation um, is flourishing right now in the United States. And that's thanks to a lot of public and private investment and partnership. The second is that patenting of AI innovation is also flourishing and the patent system's working well to incentivize this, this work. And the third point is a suggestion um, that it's getting more and more important that the patent examiners who are looking at these innovations are kept up to speed um, on the latest technology. So on the first point that AI innovation is flourishing in the United States, um, I'll keep this brief. I know that everybody um, is probably well versed in this and has been hearing about it for a day and a half, but it's useful to look at some of the numbers and activity to frame the conversation. Um, AI technology is expected to drive 3.7 trillion in economic growth in the United States by 2030. And a big part of that growth are government policies like the increases in the federal AI research budget, which in 2021 is expected to be 55% more than just last year. Um, there's also legislation like the National AI Act that's supposed to drive you know, more R&D and growth. And that's just a small sampling of what's going on uh, in the public sector. And then from the private sector, uh, just last year, there was $23 billion in investment in AI technologies. And Google's parent company, Alphabet, in the last five years has put in $105 billion to R&D overall, which of course includes our, our AI work. And then in academia, you have universities like MIT who have committed a billion dollars to this area. So there's really a tremendous commitment um, from the public and private sectors to invest in and grow uh, AI technology in the United States. And I think a big part of this um, conversation and growth is really about um, access to AI technology, which is an issue underlying all of what we're talking about today. 
um, because not everyone can build their own AI model and not everyone has the compute um, resources to run those models. So much of the investment and in activity um, that's taking place now is about democratizing AI access so that as large and diverse a community of researchers as possible um, has access to it. And Google's played a big role in this too. Um, our TensorFlow machine learning platform um, enables smaller companies and nonprofits and, and academics to build their own AI applications that help them meet their business and technology goals. So first and foremost, I think my main takeaway is that AI innovation is flourishing in the United States right now. Um, and it's being brought to a large community of researchers and businesses. Um, but a second and related point to this is that the patenting of these uh, innovations is also flourishing. And we believe that the patent system is working well to incentivize this work. Um, the PTO put out a report just recently um, called Inventing AI, which shows activity in AI patenting in the United States. Um, from 2002 to 2018, we've seen a more than 100% increase um, in patenting happening. And over the same period, the share of patent applications going into the PTO um, that contain AI subject matter almost doubled from nine to 16%. And among the entities driving this growth, you're seeing US companies um, who were issued more than 70% of these patents according to uh, an IEEE report. So overall growth of patenting has been extremely strong and American companies have been a big part of that growth too. Uh, and that includes Google. Um, AI patenting has been um, a major growth area for us um, in our large portfolio. That's, that's one of the largest pieces. Um, and that same USPTO report um, estimated we've obtained about 11,000 AI related patents um, over time. Um, and I mentioned we'll be submitting comments today to the PTO on, on these issues um, in response to a request over the summer on the topic. But, um, already mentioned um, a previous PTO report on this. Um, just a couple of years ago, the PTO asked the public, you know, how is the IP law calibrated for AI innovation? Kind of asking a similar question that we're, we're talking about today and at this conference, you know, is it calibrated correctly? And I, I want to just quote from the report. Um, the PTO found that across all IP topics, a majority of commenters expressed a general sense that the existing US IP laws are calibrated correctly to address the evolution of AI. Um, and this is just a, a summary from 2020. Um, and this includes the issue of inventorship that we're talking about on this panel as well. Uh, the majority of stakeholders in that report did not believe um, changes should be made in order to further incentivize or promote growth. Uh, and we do share that view as well. Um, we, we don't think a computer can be an inventor. It does need to be a human. Um, but in our view, a human's always involved, um, either at the front end, the back end, or both. Um, and, and the reason is, you know, AI is obviously incredibly important as a discovery tool, but a human is needed to, to do many things, to design the algorithm itself, to evaluate the output, to recognize the merits of what's coming out, to make modifications based on real world issues, uh, and then conduct further validation and experimentation. Um, and this human involvement results in a human inventor. Uh, and you know, it's coming down to the claims, but there are going to be humans involved all along the way. Um, which brings me to my third and final point, and then I will wrap up. Um, <clears throat> because of all this activity, it's getting really, really important that the patent examiners who look at these innovations are kept up to speed on the latest technology. Um, and why is that? Well, I mentioned just a moment ago that the share of patent applications that have AI in them has grown from nine to 16% at the PTO, which when you look at 600,000 patent applications coming in, that's a huge number, um, especially when you think about the fact that these are not core AI innovations, these are applications of AI. So basically a large subset of the examining core now considers themselves an AI examiner to some extent. So with this in mind, it's really important that patent examiners who look at AI inventions, whether it's core or applications of AI are kept up to speed with mandatory technical training. Otherwise, I think we'll see a situation where 
you know, it could be more challenging to get a patent on deserving technology, or you'll see undeserving patents getting granted um, that would impact all of this follow on innovation in the field. So I, I'll close there. I look forward to talking about all of this more during the rest of the, the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sheridan. Our next panelist is uh, Dennis Crouch. Uh, Dennis Crouch is an associate professor of law at the University of Missouri School of Law and director of the Center for Intellectual Property and Entrepreneurship. He's known for his patent law writings and for running the website Patently.io. Uh, Crouch's current work focuses on the future of inventors and inventorship as our system steadily moves towards corporate control. At the University of Missouri, he teaches a hands-on patent course that includes patent use prosecution as well as litigation strategies. Professor Crouch, the floor is yours. Awesome, thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, my topic is slightly different uh, and, and what I'm calling it today is corporations uh, as inventive artificial intelligence. Uh, I, I believe we can draw an analogy uh, from these debates over machine-based artificial intelligence uh, and their corporate cousins uh, that we might term organizational artificial intelligence. Uh, but unlike their computer-bound AI cousins, corporations already have been granted personhood status. Uh, many of the accompanying civil rights, including property rights, contract, privacy, speech, some of these rights emerged via common law, others via statute. Uh, many of them are grounded in the United States Constitution uh, if you're in America. Uh, so the bottom line here is that this corporate personhood status has expanded its tentacles uh, into most aspects of human life today. Uh, in, the, in the intellectual property sphere, a corporation is usually thought to be the originator of trade secret information, as it's that entity that takes the reasonable measures to keep it secret. Likewise, with trademark rights, and maybe we'll hear more in the later panel, with trademark rights, it's the business that uses the mark in commerce. Um, that's the key for claiming those rights. Uh, importantly, with copyright, uh, Congress, right, the courts did a little bit and then Congress stepped in uh, to, to uh, copyright law uh, to say that the corporate employer can be considered the author of copyrighted works uh, uh, un under this work made for hire doctrine. Uh, in all these IP creation scenarios, it's usually what we call natural people, humans, who do the work, uh, but ownership flows automatically uh, to the corporation as part of the legal fiction of, of agency law, uh, but not just ownership in those regards, right? It's really something more. We have authorship, uh, we have originator, right? Uh, seeing this entity as the originator. Now, the patent realm, is a bit different. Uh, uh, of course, a corporation can own patent rights, um, but up to now, uh, up to now, most uh, governments, including uh, the United States, have refused to recognize corporations as the inventive entities themselves. Uh, in that sense, there's no corporate uh, corporate invention uh, because because corporate ownership of patent rights are derived uh, rather than original. They they. They stem from a transfer of property rights uh, that, that begin with a human inventor uh, in that chain of title. Uh, in my view, this no corporate invention rule is somewhat surprising, considering two important trends over the past 230 years, which is really the timeline for US patent law. Um, one of these trends is this uh, strong emergence of corporate personhood rights and the legal fiction that a corporation has ownership over employee uh, contributions and other developments within the firm. Uh, at the same time, we also have seen uh, a, an interesting decrease, I, at least I've seen, in the threshold of the inventorship requirement. Um, and uh, uh, for, for, for today's discussion, I'll just mention a couple of examples. One of them, right, from, from 1952, Section 103 of the United States Patent Act, uh, which was slightly amended in 2011, uh, states that patentability will not be negative or negated by the manner in which the invention was made. Uh, another example of this is in the America Invents Act of 2011, 
uh, where section 102 F was eliminated, uh, that provision was the express requirement that the named inventor actually be the inventor. Uh, another, another even more recent example comes from uh, what I think is a very interesting federal court of appeals for the federal circuit decision uh, involving Dana-Farber, uh, which is a branch uh, of, of Harvard University. Uh, that case particularly nails down a low bar for becoming a joint inventor. Uh, in that case, we had, a, we had a couple of Harvard professors uh, who, um, who provided data on some particular biochemical pathways, and they gave that data to a Japanese researcher, Dr. Honjo. Now, Dr. Honjo is a super creative individual. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize for some of his works. Uh, he took that data, as well as some of his own data, uh, and was able to conceive a particular invention that turned out to be highly valuable. Later, Harvard sued for ownership rights, saying it was derived from their employee uh, inventors. Uh, and, and, and the federal circuit found that that data that was provided was sufficient uh, to, to say that those individuals contributed to the invention and should be rendered co-inventors. Yesterday, uh, I, I think it was Nicole Spence uh, who explained that in this realm of AI, data is the fuel of the future, right? And Professor Rye also talked about this importance of data uh, as the key, a key element of AI. Um, we know that data itself is not a patentable invention, uh, but, uh, but one thing that Dana-Farber tells us is that, is that data may be enough to be considered a joint inventor. Um, now, in my view, corporations are regularly providing sufficient contribution, at least to meet this joint inventorship test uh, via some combination of their human agents, their machines, including their AI, their other tools or organizations or instructions that they're doing, right? Especially if we get into uh, uh, some kind of highly uh, complex uh, company. Uh, of course, if we have corporate inventorship, it also solves, I think, this AI inventorship problem, uh, because if the AI is doing the work, uh, then, uh, then we can use the legal fiction uh, that the corporation has invented. Uh, now, some of you may have balked at this um, casual parallels between um, classic machine-based AI and, and my notion of, of organizational intelligence. Um, but, uh, but we can just note the same philosophers who have, who have written and thought a lot about AI sentience have also long debated uh, the similar ideas about whether a corporation is a moral entity. Uh, generalized sentient AI don't exist yet, but what does exist in our midst are corporations, legal persons making intelligent human-like decisions. Uh, one reason they make these decisions, they're owned by humans, often owned by humans, often managed by humans, um, but at the same time, they're clearly not human. Uh, and um, a, a well-structured company can, uh, can and perhaps may effectively run itself as an organizational machine distinct from any uh, human components. Now, all of this to me sounds a little bit like the emperor in Star Wars, um, right, where he's pushing Luke to say, come on, uh, complete your acceptance to the dark side. We just need this one more step, uh, right? We, right? Corporations are already the creator of all these, originator of all these other forms of IP. Why not corporate invention, inventorship? Um, for me, I, I actually want to ask a slightly different question. Why hasn't it happened already? Um, you know, Trevor Cook uh, aptly suggested, and I think, uh, I, and I think uh, Ms. Sheridan also in, in a way alluded to this, that AI as inventor is a bit of a sideshow. Um, and, and the reason, uh, it turns out that corporate owners are not pushing for the legal fiction of corporate ownership. One of the reasons um, is that only with very few exceptions, uh, only with very few exceptions, companies have already been able to obtain ownership in key economic rights and inventions. Today, it's, and, and in particular, it's actually incredibly easy to, uh, to find, or, or I might say, prop up a human inventor who is related to the project. Uh, when companies did, what companies did lobby for in the AIA change uh, was, to, uh, was to create a system where, where even if the named inventor was a legal fiction, um, that, that legal fiction is not gonna be able 
ordinarily to be used to undermine patent rights anymore. Uh, thus, as AI development continues, I believe companies will really have no problem obtaining patents under the current system, uh, except in a few examples where they might not be able to identify a closely related uh, human inventor. Um, now, in the US, we have this long-standing American romantic myths. We've got liberty. We've got manifest destiny. We've got the American inventor. Uh, moving from human inventors to corporate inventorship, uh, I, I think, right, I, I think starts to destroy that romantic notion of inventorship. This is reflected, I think, in, um, in Professor Gervais' skepticism it, to some extent. Um, it's also, um, it's also right, this notion of, of, of that myth, I think, is also kind of related to the last panel's discussion of drug pricing, um, where, um, where although pricing is not really based on costs, that story is one the public accepts uh, as justifying high costs. Um, likewise, uh, the story of human inventors adds to the palette. Um, but then what do we get with all this, right? We have this, in the end, what do we have? We have, uh, on the one hand, the current system where we have a legal fiction of human inventorship. Um, or on the other hand, we have this legal fiction of corporate inventorship. Um, now, when I talk with my students about legal fictions, I do it with some amount of distaste because a legal fiction is an untruth that we tell that we've decided it's okay to speak this untruth because somehow it better leads to justice or a better society. Um, but just as I conclude, um, I'll just suggest that these are not the only two choices. Uh, and, and maybe we can have an endeavor uh, where, where we have a structured system, uh, but we're also moving away from allowing untruths to be our guide in granting patent rights. Thanks so much. Thank you, Professor Crouch. And last, but by no means least, is Professor Sangjo Zhang. He's professor of law at Seoul National University School of Law, and he's the civilian co-chairperson of the Presidential Council of Intellectual Property. Uh, professor Zhang's research and teaching focus on copyright, trademark, patent, unfair competition, antitrust, and internet law. He has served as the dean of the Seoul National University School of Law, the president of the Korea Gangman Law and Policy Society, the director of the Seoul National University Center for Law and Technology, and a panel member of the WIPO Arbitration and Mediation Center. Professor Zhang, the floor is yours. Thank you for introduction. Uh, can you see the slides? Yes, I can, and I can hear you Good. great. It's a great honor for me to be able to participate in this uh, panel. I learned a lot from previous presentations on AI and protecting AI output. Um, as you know, uh, as you know, uh, artificial intelligence relies heavily on data uh, in, during the course of creating something or inventing and uh, making inventions or performing whatever uh, it is uh, it is um, expected to do. Uh, for example, in a historic Go match between AlphaGo, uh, Google's artificial intelligence, and Isedol, a human Go Go master in Seoul, Korea. Uh, it might have been inevitable for AlphaGo to beat him because, because AlphaGo studied more than 30 million Go notations, which no human Go player could do. And during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, as you know, a Korean chatbot named Iruda became very popular because the chatbot was able to speak as naturally and tenderly as your girlfriend or boyfriend. Uh, the conversation capability of the chatbot was made possible only, only by learning more than 10 billion human messages. So we found that even a machine can talk like a human being if and only if there are enough big data. Now, uh, Artificial intelligence is able to make inventions or draw pictures just like humans do. In case of a portrait, Edmund Bellamy, which was sold at Christie auction for more than $400,000, its AI painter named Obvious studied more than 15,000 portraits. Uh, during the pandemic, we have ourselves produced an overwhelming amount of data over the internet. 
And we have come to realize that big data is the most important asset in the age of artificial intelligence. Given the importance of big data, companies like Shinan Card, which is Korean uh, credit card company, SK Telecom, telecommunication company of Korea, and GS Retail, which is a retail company, promoted a data alliance among themselves recently. The data alliance becomes a private data dam that collects, combines, analyzes, and distributes all data from its among its member companies. The Korean government is also going to build a data dam so that data can be widely used by artificial intelligence. Data dam sounds uh, strange to you, probably strange, very strange to you, but it is a, such a serious project in Korea that the government expected to invest dozens of billions of dollars in public data dam project uh, next year and the following year. More important than the data dam itself is that it needs a appropriate legal infrastructure. At present, it is not clear what rights are available for data, who has the right to data, to what extent data is protected, and to what extent access and use of data are permitted uh, by artificial intelligence and so on. In addition, robots, crawlers, spiders do not understand data property rights at all. It is difficult for crawlers, spiders, and robots to expect us uh, to respect the data property when collecting data. Due to the uncertainty of data property, the frequent use of crawlers, legal disputes over the data have increased. For example, um, as you see in this case, a legal dispute happened between a uh, real, real property uh, companies. And uh, in this case, and in this case, actually, uh, the most of the real, real, real estate sales and monthly rent data are uploaded by consumers uh, like ourselves. So a significant portion of data available on the two platforms had to be similar to each other. However, the plaintiff could not prove that data on the defendant platform was copied by a crawler, uh, sorry, by a crawler without permission. And so the court could not accept the claim that data property rights were infringed, uh, no matter whether the uh, copyright or whether, no matter whether the uh, uh, database right. Uh, by contrast, by contrast, the plaintiff, Job Korea, was able to prove that unauthorized copying and use of recruitment information or job data through web crawling was an unfair competition. So Central District Court found in this case that Job Korea collected manage it, all of its job data with a substantial amount of investment money and effort. The court held that unauthorized copy and use of job data by a competing company uh, like Saramin was contrary to fair trade practices or fair competition under the Unfair Competition Preve Prevention Act of Korea. It is interesting to note that court of appeals in this case found that unauthorized access to and use of job data by a crawling method violates the rights of Job Korea as a database manufacturer. So there is a distinction between the right of database manufacturer or database producer and simply unfair competition, simple unfair competition. Uh, here we can notice the difference between uh, the, the uh, trespass uh, theory under competition and infringement database right, which is uh, protected under the Copyright Act. The problem becomes more complex when artificial intelligence uses copyright works as its training data. In the case of Edmund de Bellamy's portrait, its algorithm 
was trained on a set of 15,000 portraits from online art encyclopedia wiki art. The question here is whether the algorithm should get permission from copyright owners in copying those uh, 15,000 portraits. Fortunately, in this case, 15,000 portraits all span 14th to 19th century as such, all copyrights have expired. What happens, however, if all or some of data is subject to valid copyright? Does the drawing robot have to get permission from copyright owners? Will the robot be liable for copyright infringement or can it claim fair use? How does an artificial intelligence distinguish copyright works from big data which is not copyrightable? So many questions will go on and on with regard to big data. In determining whether the use of a work in any particular case is a fair use, the, there are four factors to consider, as you know, the, uh, sorry, the purpose of the uh, uh, use, uh, the effect of the use on the market, uh, and so on and so on. And in one of the most famous US case, Authors Guild versus Google, the Court of Appeals re relied on a very important factor that is transformative use. And interestingly, transformative use, the concept of transformative use is also recognized as an important factor in determining fair use in Korea too. However, the most serious question to me is whether the fact of transformative use gives an ultimate solution to data analysis by artificial intelligence. In response to increasing importance of data and uncertainties relating to fair use, several members of parliament proposed a amendment bill to amend Copyright Act of Korea. According to the amendment bill, reproduction, transmission of data are allowed as fair use to the extent necessary to generate additional value by analyzing large amount of data, including a large number of copyright works. In the amendment bill, the fair use of data analysis is distinguished from enjoying thoughts or feelings expressed in the work. That distinction between a data analysis and enjoying the thoughts and feelings is reminiscent of the approach taken by Japanese Copyright Act. By contrast, there are also some members of parliament in Korea who think data need more protection, much stronger protection than before. To expand legal protection for data, some of par parliament members proposed a legislative bill to amend Unfair Competition Prevention Act. The amendment bill try to try and introduce a new example of unfair competition. For example, unauthorized use of technical and business data when the data have been collected and managed in a significant amount by electronic method. There is no answer in this bill, however, to the question whether and to extent there is any exception for data analysis. There are several other legislative proposals to protect data on the basis of either property approach or liability approach. So at the moment, there are so many proposals for legal protection of data property that we are confused or worried that if those legislative proposals turned into actual laws, then the industry might suffer from overprotection of data and underutilization of them. Most of the legislative proposals strengthen data protection while stipulating the fair use standards only in an abstract way. So it is not clear to what extent data analysis by artificial intelligence is permitted. All the proposals are not expected to become law as such. 
we will have to wait and see which proposal will survive and whether those proposals will be revised to reflect demands from the industry, demands from the artificial intelligence. Uh, protection of data and fair use will be the subject of much debate, not only in Korea, but also all over the world. I look forward to uh, your views and your comments or your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Zhang. Uh, I've been instructed to let all attendees know the, the, uh, the, the CLE password for this panel. It's ash, uh, like the, 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 the carbon residue after something burns. Uh, if you want letters, Alpha Sierra Hotel, ash. Uh, again, so the P CLE password for this, this panel is ASH Alpha Sierra Hotel. Uh, I'll put that in the chat box in a minute. Uh, if th there are, uh, I, uh, but if I'll take questions now, while if uh, other people have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Uh, I'm going to start by asking a question that was posted there early by my colleague, Chris Newman. Uh, this is for all the panelists. Why would one want patent rather than just trade seeker protection for a trained algorithm? Are complete functional copies of such algorithms ever transferred to others under licensing? Anybody have thoughts on that? So I'm happy to, to talk about that a little bit. I also responded um, in written form. So I, I think what, what I'm seeing anyway, and I, admittedly, this is mostly in the AI-enabled medical area, uh, because that's what I've studied in terms of actually looking at the patents um, and talking to people, is that folks seek patent protection there's not real need to have a lot of disclosure. And then, yes, absolutely, the everything else is kept under wraps, either via non-disclosure agreements or via very carefully, in, even in the licensing context, very carefully negotiated agreements to ensure that there isn't much leakage of, of either the functional algorithm or the underlying data. And Eric, I might just add to that, uh, that uh, I, I totally agree with everything that, that Artie mentioned, but uh, in addition, I think it's just good to recognize with patents, uh, you know, there have been studies about smartphones, how, uh, how at one time there were something like 200,000 patents, uh, all, uh, all that covered some aspect of one of Apple's phones. Uh, and um, right, the same thing happens and, and, and is happening and will happen with artificial intelligence uh, in that you, you may have a patent on some small aspect uh, that might help you in the marketplace to ensure that your AI is uh, we're, we're potentially shutting down, you can potentially shut down competitors. Uh, but, um, but at the same time, uh, it's not like a patent that covers the entire AI. Uh, and, and so that layered approach with, with heavy use of trade secrets, heavy use of contractual protections, as well as use of patents. I think all of those are, are the, uh, the model approach that people are taking. I'll also just briefly add, you know, that this is an area, of course, that has a lot of open sourcing as well. I mean, a lot of that relates to the, the things that folks build upon with their own data and create their own train models with it. But um, it is currently, and I don't think we see much changing, that it's a very open community still because there's just a lot of benefit from you know, the more that is made available, the more that researchers can build upon and improve the existing technology for, for everybody. So, I mean, I think, you know, there is trade secret activity, but I think there's, there's just probably a lot more openness um, just given the nature of this area, especially with um, academia so heavily involved too, and that's kind of the culture. Two quick oh. points, if I may. Uh, Can I also just respond to Laura just really quickly? Go, go ahead, Artie. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I think that's right. But it also is depends on where you're looking. So I've been looking mostly in the medical space where everything is very locked down. So, yeah. Two quick points. One is uh, I, I, I'm, I'm very glad this last point came up because I think we're still, I uh, think the jury's still out on the role of open innovation versus proprietary innovation here. but. Uh, I was struck also in the previous panel, there's a discussion of, you know, we should have more patents on AI because there'll be more disclosure. And the example given, I forget who mentioned it, was the COVID vaccines. They're protected by patents. 
um, it's, <laughs> it's not because there's a patent that everything be disclosed. In fact, the problem with the COVID vaccine is, is not the patent, apparently. If, if you look at the TRIPS waiver discussion, it's all focused on the trade secret of the RNA technology that is not in the patent uh, applications, apparently. So uh, again, I'm not an expert on RNA and why you need the know-how. I've been trying to understand that. But, but the point is that a patent does not necessarily mean all of this becomes fully disclosed. Yeah, no, that's a huge, I mean, I've talked a lot about that issue in, in, on other panels. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it, it is the case that you, uh, and going back to what Dennis said, you patent very strategically so mm -hmm. as to disclose as little as you can, have mm -hmm. an asset that you can assert against your competitors um, mm -hmm. and that will not undermine your competitive position through disclosure in any way. Yeah, but the TRIPS agreement is not an issue as far as patents, there's plenty of compulsory licensing issues. No, that's not the issue. The issue is how do you yeah, force yeah, companies to disclose agree. the trade secret? And we don't have a tool for that as TRIPS now stands. So, I'm going to single on a question from Christina. I apologize if I get the name wrong. Uh, the, as I understand the question, or the, the part I want to focus on is what, uh, part of the question is to ask, should there be new limited IP rights for AI creative outcomes? And I think part of the question also is, might there be different standards for novelty, non-obviousness, originality for specialized IP tailored towards uh, AI products? Uh, well, since I mentioned that in my presentation, maybe I, I, I can make three quick Please points. Do. So uh, one is uh, a question of uh, policy burden of proof. So if there's something that's not protected by IP rights now, who has the burden of proving that we need some new IP right? Uh, and and uh, you know, do you just protect it because it has value or do you need something else? I think you need something else that actually shows that the IP right will create an incentive for something I've quickly defined as progress. I, I could elaborate on that. But um, the second point is the issue of related rights was mentioned um, and uh, th that those are rights that are related to copyright. They're not, uh, and there's this fiction in the US that we don't have them, we do, we just don't call them that. I have a, a paper in that Journal of Copyright Society if you wanna read more about that, but I do believe we have them. Question is not, can we do this? It's the same question as can we say that an AI is a person as a matter of law? Of course we can. My, my whole presentation is should we, not can we? Um, and, and third, uh, the question, is, and I finished with this one, I'm struck by the amount of discussion of trying to fit AI into cognitive tests that were not designed for AI, like obviousness, for example. What's obvious to human and what's obvious to machine is not the same thing. We have the same word, but it's not the same test, really. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I don't know what the answer is on this one. I just know, I note the debates and I'm kind of, worried that we're trying to retrofit an existing system for something. And we've done it before, but this technology is qualitatively different because it replaces human higher mental faculties. No technology in the past has done exactly that. So I'll leave it at that. Other panelists. Hearing none, uh, Josh Sarnoff and, and some other people asked some questions to the uh, uh, asking questions I think about analogs to joint authorship as between humans and the machines producing AI output. So are there ways to ad adapt legal concepts of joint authorships and apply them to differentiate the contributions of people and artificial intelligence to new intellectual works? Um, happy to go again. Uh, so, uh, uh, but you know, I, so uh, Laura said something very interesting. She said, there's always a human. And of course she's right. Uh, at some point there's a human. The question is how far is the human from the output? I think to me, that's the harder question. Um, I, I did a, a study for the EU of a lot of patent and copyright uh, type outputs, uh, which is you know publicly available. You can find it easily, but it basically says there's always a human in the loop somewhere. Uh, at this point anyway, but sometimes the human is so far removed. Um, and so I asked the question this way, if you program an AI to write poems or music, let's say music is probably more relevant because Nashville, I live in Nashville, I know they're using this machine, these machines a lot now. So let's say that you're, you're getting the machine to produce some music and it does, and the, the song's infringing. I guarantee you these companies will say, it's not us, we have nothing to do with this machine did it. 
Uh, but if it becomes a big hit, then they'll want all of it, right? So, so the question is, and to me that illustrates the break in the cause, I call it uh, the causation chain. And, and to me, I think that's a test we need to focus on is did the humans actually cause this output sufficiently to be considered an author and inventor. Of course, if you go with, uh, and, and Dennis, by the way, I'm not being romantic at all here. Uh, I, I, this is not the romantic inventor or author. It's really a question of, is there a human in the loop? And if not, you know, should we, should we uh, you know, create an incentive for, for, for the, that machine to do, to do what it does? Other panelists? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll just add, I mean, so, so I think all this goes to, uh, does, just go back to the question um, that that maybe right in, in U.S. law goes back to our, our constitutional provisions that say, look, the the idea here is we're trying to incentivize something, uh, and mm -hmm. um, right, and, and and I think it um, right. So at, at one at right when you look when you read directly like the constitutional provision, it talks about kind of directly incentivizing. The author or inventor, which which we can really, I think, readily say, well, that's going to be that they're talking about humans. Um, but um, uh, but or is the question that we want to incentivize the output? Do we want to incentivize the creation of the work uh, or the creation of this new discovery? Uh, and um, and um, uh, and so if right if that's really the purpose. Uh, then, um, right? Then maybe we do need to design systems that really focus in on, you know, in this new model of how people or how humanity as a whole, including our machine creations, are, are making new things. Um, right? Where is right? Where is the incentive needed to encourage that? Uh, and uh, and and certainly, I think that that may deserve some kind of shift. Uh, it, right? It, and, uh, and depending on your uh, framework, right? There's some people with a framework that say, well, we ought to begin with the notion that if you create it, you should own it. Um, and then there's also, right? And then there's also a framework that many in the IP uh, academia have it, that is, um, is that something uh, we should not have property rights on, uh, on new intellectual creations unless they're justified we need them for some purpose for encouraging this output or, or because perhaps some kind of justice reason. I'm going to move to a question by Ileana Paneva. Uh, I, I think the thrust of this question is to ask, might it be appropriate to protect AI intellectual works, if at all, using a sui generis system? Uh, so, uh, 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 is and uh, the, the question as uh, uh, Pineva says uh, in the question, there's no sui generis database in the, in the U.S. because opponents uh, think they, they claim that the existing legal regime pr provides adequate protection by contract law and unfair competition law. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe the uh, better instead of trying to use patent and copyright and trade secrecy to cover AI, either. Uh, Leave it out of those systems and make people uh, like establish and justify a statutory uh, right analogous to a database right that doesn't exist. And if they cannot get that, then mm -hmm. don't have it at all. Uh, do panelists have any reaction to that line of argument? Oh, m most definitely. Uh, <laughs> so what happened is the database right. Some people on the call may not know. So it, in 1991, U.S. Supreme Court said data wasn't protected by copyright, the Feist case, and then. The larvae articles in the two years that follows, we're, we're going to lose the database industry in the United States. The sky has fallen. For the next three Congresses, bills were introduced to create a right in databases without which we would have no databases in this country. And the EU said, we're going to get the Americans on this one. And they adopted a sweet, generous right on database uh, databases that does not require originality, um, just investment. Well, last I checked, I think the US is doing OK compared to Europe on databases. So. Um, I, this is a good example of a policy mistake. And I think even the EU and its reports on the database directive acknowledges that. So I think that's not a very good precedent. That being said, there are related rights or slash sui generis rights that have worked. Uh, plant variety has been called a sui generis right. That plant variety right works reasonably well. Uh, so again, it's a question of burden of proof. Do you need it? Will it do something better? And I agree with Dennis. We need incentives for progress, not change. We need 
incentives or stuff that is actually positive that would not happen otherwise. Um, so I, I'm not sure we're there yet, but the, the database right um, is, uh, is, is probably a, a precedent I would not use too, too much uh, to, to, uh, to, if I were trying to justify. Last thing very quickly is I heard a lot of need in the previous panel, the need to protect clinical data. Well, we have that. Um, and uh, you know, uh, data protection for the pharmaceutical industry is pretty strong. Some people have even written that it's stronger than patents in a way. Uh, the non-reliance and so on uh, through the the FDA's process, and so that there's a question: Do we need more uh, than this? Right? And the, I don't know. The, I don't have the answer, but it's worth asking. So one of the issues that I, I want to bring up, which relates to data and is has that not, as far as I know, been talked about in this panel, and I apologize, I was not able to attend the prior panel or yesterday's panels, um, is of course the the reality that data ownership is becoming quite concentrated in many industries. And the question of whether IP would um, reduce concentration or accelerate concentration, additional IP, because um, we already have like de facto secrecy and contractual protection and all those kinds of things. But what I mean is additional protection beyond that. And 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 I, you know, that's a, an interesting question to me at least, because I am quite concerned about data monopolies. And I think machine learning presents a very um, effective case actually for the value of monopoly in the sense that like you really want large, large data sets. But on the other hand, and that maybe the monopoly is the way then to have those large data sets. On the other hand, it scares me a lot to think of those large data monopolies um, that would create markets in, to which, into which entry would be impossible. Yeah, I was going to agree completely with what Artie uh, was mentioning, and that, that was going to be in part my comment to say, well, the other tool here is actually antitrust. Uh, and it's, antitrust is kind of interesting because it's like, in some ways, it's like, hold on, we're slowing things down with antitrust. Instead of giving more property rights, we're trying to push you down. Uh, but the basic idea behind antitrust uh, is, to, um, right, is to ensure competition. Uh, and uh, right, and if right, if you're of the viewpoint that when we have uh, genuine competition, that's another mechanism for really encouraging innovation. Uh, that um, that that's how antitrust becomes a tool here, uh, because right, even if you don't own the data in all of the people who have visited your website, you do have full control over it. Uh, and right, and, and it just really appears that the way things are. Uh, shaking up with AI is that the entities that hold the data uh, are are having significant amount of power in this area. Uh, of of course, right? It may well be that we're shown wrong that some new entrant is able to come in and uh, and bypass all of that. Uh, but so far, it, that doesn't really seem to be what's happening. An anonymous attendee asked, I think in follow-up to the last round of uh, answers, uh, when, uh, when, when legislatures pass laws of uh, creating uh, specialized IP rights, aren't the laws, uh, the, like uh, those laws, do they, are, are they incentivizing the creation of new information or are they more incentivizing uh, the disclosure of the information? And she said, uh, the uh, attendee asks, uh, many companies protect their databases through trade secrets specifically because if they were to share them, U.S. laws wouldn't protect, protect them. I'm curious if panelists have reaction to that line of thought. Uh, uh, two very quick points is when the database rights were being discussed, uh, they, this is the era of relational database technology. We've moved past that in many ways. Um, the AI technology doesn't use that at all. So, um, so that's one problem that happens with, with regulation as you regulate the future and you don't know the future. So the future develops and then the regulation is complete. Like the EU database right at this point is just weird. Um, so <clears throat> that's a, you know, the risk that you take. Uh, but the question is, do you incentivize disclosure? I mean, when federal uh, you know, law protects trade secrets like it does now, uh, and of course we've had state laws for a long time, that's obviously not to, to, you know, so some of, or I guess, I guess are meant to accelerate disclosure like that law. 
and some are not, but then it also depends how you interpret patent law and the, the obligation to enable and disclose and so on and how much you require. And uh, we discussed that before. I don't think that uh, you're required to disclose everything very, very far from it. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, the basic there, idea is that if we're designing a sui generis law, we can do it however we want. Right. And, and, and you know, in our most recent, uh, I, may, I may have my timeline wrong, but our most recent, uh, in a sense, sui generis law, uh, it, it, right, it was, it was really an adaption, but it was creation of a federal right of trade secret protection. Uh, and right where we moved from that being primarily or really only state law uh, into being very much, at least at the civil level, uh, a federal law. Uh, and uh, right, and obviously with that form of, uh, if we call it intellectual property, uh, does not require and in fact really prohibits disclosure in order to have protection. Uh, and so anytime we design this, uh, and I would suspect that, um, right, I, I would suspect that uh, if we, um, Right, the, the large data sets are really so valuable today uh, that, um, that I suspect that any kind of offer for property rights in exchange for, for kind of full disclosure of that uh, would need to be extremely valuable property rights handed over. Uh, you know, just like in the last panel, we had discussions from, uh, from uh, the, um, uh, counsel from major pharmaceutical companies um, telling how they have right several right hundreds of thousands of patient years worth of data on prior trials that they've gone through, uh, and uh, and that's there right those companies are not willingly going to disclose those uh, absent uh, absent some kind of really valuable. Um, sorry, something very valuable they're given, uh, or perhaps some kind of forced antitrust move. Yes, that's a really interesting point, um, Dennis. I, I completely agree. And one of the things that uh, just as a just a matter of um, history that I've written about a little bit is that the Daniel referred to the regulatory exclusivities that companies have, pharmaceutical companies have over data. In principle. In my interpretation of the law, they're supposed to disclose the data after the regulatory exclusivity ends, but they have fought that tooth and nail and been very successful in fighting that tooth and nail. So I, that also buttresses your point that even if there is a purported requirement, it's not going to really be implemented. Okay, maybe a couple of thoughts on one last question. Earlier, uh, on, uh, attendee Josh Sarnoff had asked the question, assuming that people or someone wants to try to get uh, uh, intellectual product patented, uh, should the standards for uh, 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 the person having a, a obvious skill in the art be construed differently? Should there be a different statutory standard for that uh, uh, when you're talking about uh, an invention that's made by an artificial intelligence? Well, obviously the faceta is, was a human for the, ever. And now the question is, is the faceta still human? Um, and to me, that's a huge qualitative change. And we just can't say, well, of course, you know, it doesn't matter. We were technologically neutral, human, not human. I think there are questions there to be asked. You know, there's a, there's a related point on this. And, you know, when uh, back in the 1970s, uh, kind of the, um, the average invention um, patented invention had, on average, a little bit more than one inventor per patent. Uh, and, uh, and, and then um, in the 1990s, I think the average went up over two. Uh, mm -hmm. And now the average is over three human inventors listed per patent. Uh, and, right, and so already we're kind of facing that because a team of three people, a team of three humans, has a different capacity. What's obvious to a mm -hmm. team of three people is also different than what's obvious to uh, a single human. And, right, and, and really all of the old law that developed here was really in this idea that you had a single human developing this and, and, what, would, uh, right, and what would be obvious to that person. Uh, and, and so already we have that, that kind of scenario change. Uh, and now we have this added tool uh, and right, and, and certainly the court, right? Court. Everybody's already adopting this idea that if there is some tool that's readily available to a skilled artisan or to a team of skilled artisans, that you would expect them to use that tool as part of the discovery. Uh, and uh, and so um, right, and so if we see AI as a tool, 
I think it's already being incorporated and actually like really ask saying, well, you better actually be using this if it's available. Uh, just like if there's a calculator available, you should use that calculator instead of hiring human calculators who are who are slower. Uh, and so, right, and so maybe in a sense it's already incorporated, uh, but then the one question is if we have this sui generis where we where we say, okay, if you're a corporate inventor or you're an AI inventor, do we even want a different rule, right? An even higher standard uh, or something like that? And 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 maybe, although I think it really com perhaps unduly complicates the process. Can All I just right. make one quick point? I know we're over time, but just to- See, We are over time, so make it quick. <laughs> It'll be quick. It, it, just to piggyback on it, this was where my suggestion for you know technical training for examiners comes from, because it's really hard to judge obviousness if you don't know what's out there and you don't know what is really easy to apply AI to do versus what is hard. So I, I just throw that out there that this is the issue that is really why that suggestion is so important. Thank you. And with that, I'd, I'd be grateful if all the attendees could please join me in thanking the panelists for their contributions and thoughts over the last hour, uh, hour and uh, 15 minutes. And with that, uh, we're, we are done for now and we will be on to a break. And the next session will begin at 1.45. Uh, Joshua Kresh, do you have anything else you'd like to say for the benefit of the conference to the attendees? No, I just wanted to join you in thanking all the panelists. It was a great discussion and as you said, it will be back around 145 for panel five on trademarks and artificial intelligence. Wonderful. Well, thank you again.